If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, campers, hikers, and woods people. What's the most unnerving, scary encounter with other worldly things, creatures, and humans you have had in the woods, trails, etc. A while back. While camping with my son and wife in a very remote location, while they walked away to use the restroom behind a tree, I heard her and my son call my name. I went to meet them, but they came up behind me, and that stopped me dead in my tracks. They said they didn't call me, and my wife's not one to joke, especially about creepy stuff. My son would have eventually laughed or told me if it was actually them. None of my friends knew we were camping there, and it happened close to 2 a.m. in the morning. It's an island, separated on one side by a small creek. There are tons of alligators that stay out there, so I doubt anyone would have come there by the creek to scare us at 2 a.m. My name is Phil, but my wife says it like Feul, and that's how the voice called me. She says it like that all the time as a habit from teasing the way my young nieces say my name. It was a super weird thing to happen to me, and there's no explanation for it. It gives me the creeps to think that something out there was luring me under the guise of my wife and son. One night, up in Vermont, I went to sleep and was woken up by some person randomly walking around my tent. Probably 3 to 4 AM. I did 5 slow walks around my tent. I had my knife, but I don't know if it was a person or what, so I slowly opened my tent too. Nothing. I tried to figure out where the footsteps ran off, but the second my tent was opened, there was nothing there. I'm not sure if I was hallucinating it or what. Up near Bennington, Vermont, one guy said that there was a woman murdered around here, but I took it like a grain of salt. I went backpacking with four buddies. We hiked for about eight miles and set up camp. At this point, one buddy went off on his own to do some exploring and didn't return for a long time. It was dusk when he came walking back, which at this point had been about four hours. He acted like we were crazy for being upset about him being gone so long by himself because he was a big man and could take care of himself. The next morning, after we woke up and went about 20 feet outside our camp to a small lake, we saw fresh paw prints in the mud facing our camp that weren't there the previous day. The prints didn't have claw marks like a wolf or dog, which means the claws were retractable, like a cougar, which we have in our area. At that moment, the buddy who had been gone alone for so long turned white in his face, realizing he may have been getting stalked on his way back to camp. I had heard rumors of a mysterious creature lurking in the Appalachian Mountains, but I had no idea how real they were until I was forced to run for my life. My name is Jared, and I am 23 years old. It was a sunny day when I set off for a simple hike with a few friends. We were all familiar with the area, so none of us were afraid of getting lost. But little did we know that something more frightening was waiting for us. We were enjoying ourselves while walking through the dense forest. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a massive figure moving in the distance. I can't put into words how huge it was, but it had to be over 8 feet tall. I nudged my friends, and they saw the creature, too. We all stood frozen in shock until one of the guys, in a panic, screamed, run. We took off running, and although it all happened fast, I remember hearing a deep, guttural roar that I could feel vibrating through my chest. Suddenly, I felt something grab my ankle, and as I looked down, I saw it was a giant hand. I fell to the ground, and my friends kept running. I scrambled to my feet and continued running. The creature was still chasing after me, but it felt like it was slowing down. After what felt like forever, the creature disappeared, and I never looked back. I eventually made it out of the forest, safe but shaken from the experience. Three years later, I still can't believe I survived that encounter. To this day, I'm not sure what that creature was, but I can tell you that I now take every wild encounter with a grain of salt. No mountain hike is worth risking my life like that ever again. I live in a small town in Saskatchewan, Canada. I take small late night walks around my neighborhood from time to time, and after almost a year of doing it, nothing strange has happened. Until last night. I was walking along my normal route, like always. All was peaceful and quiet. I was about 20 feet away from an intersection I always cross when, out of absolutely nowhere, I saw something run across the street. It was dark, and it was moving really fast, so I couldn't make out many details, but it looked like a medium-sized dog. But it was moving way too fast to be a dog. Me, being the ignorant person I am, just thought, ha, huh, that was weird, and kept walking. As I crossed the street, the dog-like thing ran across. I looked to my right to see in what direction it was going. I just barely saw the silhouette of a person's legs as they walked behind some trees, and I didn't see anything else of them. At this point, I was getting freaked out and started walking back to my house. The whole night, 
I felt like something was watching me through my window, though it was probably just me being paranoid. I still don't know what happened out there, and I'm probably overreacting, but it still scared the hell out of me. Please let me know what you think of this. A few years back, I was camping with an indigenous mate of mine out the back of Cairns. At some point in the night, I got out of bed to deal with the call of nature when I heard my friend calling my name somewhere out in the sugar cane. It was a pitch black night with no real moon to speak of, so I reached into my swag, grabbed my torch, and set off to find him, wondering what the duck he was doing. The cane was high, and in the dark with only a small torch, it felt really disorientating. I had only made it about 30 meters when someone grabbed me from behind, covering my mouth. I'm not a fighter, but I spun around, ready to try, only to find my mate standing there, his finger over his lips, gesturing for me to be quiet. He led me back to camp without saying a word. As soon as we got back at camp, he stoked the fire until it was huge. It was only once the fire was going that he calmed down, and then he told me about the evil Jugabina spirits that try to lure people into danger in the night. I saw something I couldn't explain years ago, and this is the first time I'm now talking about it. I go camping in a widely known provincial park that I will leave nameless at the moment. I'm a big camping enthusiast, and I've been going twice a year since 2006. Once in the summer and then again in the fall before it snows. But in the summer of 2013, I had an encounter that leaves me unnerved and unsettled to this day. I drove my van and trailer up to my campsite deep into the woods, everything is as ordinary as the woods can be. Wind rustling the trees, and the faint sound of the running water of the river just down the hill. I would often hear the rustling of animals in the woods around my campsite, so I no longer notice when this happens, it becomes white noise to me. So if the thing I encountered ever came around my campsite, I'd have never known. It's now my sixth day there, and I decided to take a hike down the hill into one of the trails in the woods. I had begun to develop cabin fever and wanted to see if I could get good photos for the gram. I have now been on this trail for at least three hours and am getting good photos of the landscape I traversed. But at some point, while I stopped to take a photo of a beautiful view of the trees aligned together in the forest, I heard some minor ruffling in the distance. I had run across the path of a pack of deer earlier, so I didn't think anything of it. After a good 10 minutes, I put my camera away, ready to continue on, when I'm startled by the loud snap of a stick pretty close to my vicinity. I turn quickly now, assuming it's the deer again, as I didn't get a good photo of them. To my horror, instead, what I saw was what appeared to be a relatively large coyote, but it had small horns and walked on hooves instead of paws. It had a rather long, almost cat-like tail, and it looked like it was suffering from malnutrition. I could see its ribs pop into focus whenever it exhaled, and it had a crooked smile. One of the top incisors stuck out of its mouth. This thing hadn't noticed me, as it was a good distance away. I began to shake with nerves, and as I tried to quietly sneak back, I must have attracted its attention because it quickly snapped its gaze to me, opened its mouth to reveal a mouth with four oversized teeth overshadowing the smaller rows of teeth, and hissed at me. It turned and ran into the bushes away from me. When I returned to my campsite, I spent my time trying to figure out what I had just seen and came to the conclusion that, no matter how silly it sounds, I'm 100% certain I discovered a chupacabra. However, I can assure you that since that event, I have never come across anything like that. Back in 2016, I was in Virginia with my mom. She had gone through a pretty messy breakup at the time, but we made the most of it by doing what we loved, which was hiking. She introduced me to her friend, her husband, and their children. This family also brought their Rottweiler with them. Which one of my mom's friends was a cute girl my age. It was a trail in the Blue Ridge part of the Appalachian Mountain Trail somewhere in Virginia. I think the trail we were going to do that day was Old Rag, but it was either too muddy to go on or we were too inexperienced to do that trail. At some points, we would all be split up, and I would always be the one in the front way ahead of everyone else. With this experience, I was way ahead of everyone, even the dog. On one part of the trip, we stopped and rested at an overlook. I remembered warnings from signs by my mom, her friend, her husband, the trail ranger, and a local that there were bears. But what I heard that day wasn't a bear. It sounded like a person walking, but it wasn't because it was off the trail, maybe 10 to 15 feet off the trail. I can't remember since it was so long ago, but I digress. Besides, I would have heard the dog walking because I would have heard the four legs and panting. It also never left the girl's side since we got there, so it truly couldn't have been the dog. I felt the sense of being watched while also hearing the leaves crunching in the distance, but not too far. I should also add that every time I stopped walking, it did, so I don't know if I was being stalked or hunted and I just so happened to be its victim for the day or what. 
This experience, plus others, is what made me believe in Bigfoot and all of the other unexplainable phenomena that have happened all across America. This experience had also made me feel uneasy and uncomfortable in the woods, which I speculate is because my third eye has been open for so long and I know the difference between a threat and a non-threat in the woods. I also basically grew up in the woods too. I also know the difference between watching me for just being curious about what's in its territory and being watched with the intent of being hunted, and I know what peace feels like in the woods. This happening wasn't the first, and it wasn't the last, when I lived in Virginia, and I have a lot more stories to tell. I'm up for suggestions on what it was, it could have been a multitude of things, ranging from Bigfoot, the rake, skinwalkers, wine digos, or shapeshifters. I am also aware of the fact that the skinwalker and wine dago can either shapeshift to either your worst fear or someone you know, but they are distinct from someone you know. I'm into all that folklore. Okay, so my best friend is in love with the mountains, we are both from Utah, and we hike together a lot. He always brings a bunch of stuff with him, especially cameras, to take beautiful pictures of wildlife and stuff. Anyway, last winter we installed a camera on a tree up on the mountains in northern Utah to take pictures automatically whenever it sensed any kind of movement. When we checked the pictures taken, we both were dying of fear when the camera took a picture of what appeared to be a 20-ish year old woman, which, when you say it like that, doesn't sound like much, but hear me out, the picture was taken at 3 a.m. in the morning. It was winter, temperatures were extremely cold, and it was super dark. The girl appeared to only be wearing a white dress, she had black long hair, she was just walking, but as she was walking, she was looking directly at the hidden camera. We have no explanation of what that was since it doesn't make sense that a girl would be waking up at that time with little clothes by herself during the winter. I used to frequent a relatively popular 11.5 mile hiking trail. The lot that this trail is on is only about 50 or so acres, so the trail winds back and forth in order to fit. So one day, I was hiking. This particular day was very nice, the weather was good, and I hadn't seen a lot of people. At one point, about 10 feet off my trail, I could see where I was going parallel to the same trail as it turned and snaked back about a mile ahead, I hope that makes sense, lol. I noticed that, by that section of trail, there was a fallen tree with three people sitting on it, a man, a woman, and a boy. This by itself wouldn't have been unusual, as it is one of the most popular trails in this area. The problem was that they were sitting completely still and completely silent. Their backs were to me, and they seemed to be staring straight ahead. It was almost as if they were entranced. I was very unsettled, as this is obviously unusual behavior. I kept walking. But being as unsettled by it as I was, I looked back and was startled to find that they were gone. I stopped in my tracks, listening but hearing nothing. I'll tell you why this startled me, any outdoorsman will tell you that sound travels in the woods. Sound becomes entrapped by the canopy and funneled through the trees. If somebody steps a hundred feet away, you're likely to hear it. And I, having been raised in the woods, have ears attuned to such sounds. Yet, those three people were able to move without me hearing a thing. I dismissed it. Maybe my mind was preoccupied, and I just hadn't heard them. So I turned back around to keep walking. And ahead of me, on my section of trail, there they were. With their backs to me, I saw them silently walk away over a hill. I never saw them again. So now, not only had I failed to hear them, I'd failed to see them walk past me. And I don't know how. I immediately called up my friend. I told him the children of the corn were out at Swayback and kept him on the phone so he could send help if he heard me get hit by a pitchfork or something. My wife and I were hiking at Mount Tambourine Gold Coast QLD at a hike called Witches Falls. Witches Falls is a 5 km hike that passes through some dense rainforest areas. Not many people were on the trail that day, and we did not pass anyone coming from the other direction. We were well ahead of any other hikers, and we could not hear any other hikers. We entered a straight, level section of the hike that passes through an area of rainforest with a thick ground cover of ferns and undergrowth. It was eerily quiet. A large black shape floated across the trail 20 meters ahead of us. It moved from the undergrowth and disappeared into the undergrowth. We stopped. We could not hear any noise of anything moving, and with the thick undergrowth, there should have been substantial noise as there was bark, leaves, branches, ferns, and substantial plant life. Even our footsteps on the trail were loud in this section of the hike. But we saw this shape, and there was no noise. I have no idea what it was. My guess was that it was a large black cat, like a panther. But this makes no sense at all, and the shape was at least 1.5 meters tall and 2 to 3 meters long and moved like it was floating. I had two weird encounters in Perth's eastern hills with what I later learned might have been Junju D over the 25 years I lived there. 
I walked my dogs through the state park each day, and one foggy morning I was wondering if I could walk as quietly as my dog without clomping around in my boots. I was watching the ground as we went around a large boulder, and my dog suddenly stopped and started growling like I'd only heard him do once before when a fox was at our fence. I looked up, and at first, in the fog, I didn't see anything and thought maybe it was an early morning fox. I looked where my dog was staring, and it still freaks me out now. There was a shape I didn't recognize as anything, but the more I looked, the more I realized something was wrong, and I realized it was a little person or something about three feet tall and covered in dead black boy leaves or whatever those long bits are called. That's what it looked like. An upside down dead black boy top. After about three seconds, it just went backwards around the boulder without making a sound. I wanted to go around and confirm what I thought I saw, but my dog did not want to chase it, and with the fog, I just thought I should get out of there. The second time was some years later, when a kangaroo burst across the track in front of me, going full pelt. I was used to kangaroo behavior, they would come on our lawn nearly every day, and I thought it was moving like I had seen them when they were being chased. I assumed it was a loose dog. I looked down into the bush below me to see what had been chasing it and see if I could stop it, but there was nothing there. I walked up to the edge of the bush, where it came from, and saw nothing. Then I saw movement, but I couldn't see what it was. It just looked like the top of a bush moving away from me. Not a path of bush being disturbed by an animal moving through it, but one short thing moving away from me. My dog did not even notice it this time, he was too busy sniffing after the roux. I only told one person IRL about these who has lived there for a similar length of time, and after they finished laughing, they said they'd been told by other people about these creatures, which are an old aboriginal folklore creature called Junju D. Little hairy man. So this was a Saturday night around 9 to 10 PM, and I had gone to see my friend who lived on the opposite side of my city, it's a train right away, and I was planning to visit for a few hours. So I got there for about 5 PM, and at first we were just chilling doing normal teenager SHT, and eventually we went out to smoke some W33D and just relax. So for the last few hours, we were just smoking and talking in the park, and soon it fell dark, but we remained in the park and smoked one last beyond. One of my friends was talking about horror sightings, which was a bit cliche but fitting at the time. Skinwalkers are the scariest, in my opinion, my friend said. What's a skinwalker? I asked, and they just stared at me blankly and laughed, which I found odd, but I shrugged it off. It began to get darker, and I had to go, so I said goodbye to my friends and started walking. To describe what the road looked like, which I was walking down, it was long, eerie, and had factories on one side and a canal on the other with a bike path, so I was walking down it and started to hear twigs snapping on the canal. I just thought it was an animal at first, but when it started getting a rhythm, I realized it was something else, so I sped up and suddenly started hearing noises and cries for help. Please, it hurts, it howled. Something in me just decided to check it out, and as I started to walk to it, the screams became much more cursed and horrific, it got to the point where I covered my ears so much that it stung. As I peeked over the bridge into the canal, I saw a huge, lanky, dark, and long-armed figure. As soon as I saw it, I ran for my life and went straight to my train, which luckily came early. It was just a reminder to believe in such things as they are true, as I experienced such horror. It is safe to say I never slept for another month. I have a story. This happened this year between Hogpan Gap and Low Gap Shelter. I decided to do a day hike and parked at Hogpan Gap. I started my hike in the morning, and it took me about 2.5 hours to get to the shelter. I stopped to take photos of flowers, mushrooms, and the trail. I only saw about three people as it was a Wednesday. I got to the shelter and pulled out a snack from my backpack. I started slowly walking back to Hogpen while I was checking out the scenery and eating my protein bar. I saw an owl up in a tree, took a photo, and then off I went. I heard a noise. I couldn't make out exactly what it was, an animal walking, people mumbling. I couldn't figure it out as it was off in the distance, but it didn't bother me. I just looked around. Maybe 10 minutes later, I heard it again, a tad bit closer. Again, I look around and see nothing. I got to a point on the trail where a huge rock overhangs a drop-off. I take about two steps past this spot, and I hear the noise right behind me. I quickly snapped my head around, as it took me by surprise. I see a dress hanging in the air. Where feet and a head should be, there is nothing. Just a dress. Red and white with a checkered board pattern. I can see through parts of this dress to see the tree behind it. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I actually gasped out loud. And then it just shimmered or faded away. I turned around and started trekking. I was on edge for a good hour. 
I searched the web but never found any information on that spot. This is a real story that I experienced back on my 2016 Novo. I am in the south, hiking the Appalachian Trail. I am unsure of the exact location. It was between Pierceyburg, Virginia, and Johnson City, Tennessee. I tried doing some research, and I couldn't find much information other than the Bell Witch, which is on the opposite side of Tennessee. This has been tearing me apart for the last four years. So I am hiking along with my hiking buddy. It is a clear day with no sign of rain. Nothing but blue skies. We are pretty distant from any town, or even a road, for that matter. The forest is clear of underbrush and has nothing but bare trees. We could easily see beyond 300 yards. About 150 to 200 yards up on the hill, we both saw a burned woman gazing off in the distance, not looking towards us. She was wearing a white gown, possibly a simple wedding dress. This is extremely odd for this area, so my pal and I called out loudly to her, Hey ma'am, are you lost? The woman keeps her torso and shoulders still and jerks her head towards us. The speed and angle of her head turn should have broken her neck. She let out a sharp, ear-piercing scream. It was almost like a banshee from those old stories. We ran as fast as we could with our packs. As we are running away, the wind picks up heavily. Near hurricane levels. Branches are snapping, and we even heard a tree fall in the distance. The rain started pouring. Sideways rain and strong wind. I know the weather can change like a dime in the mountains, but this just felt different. Like, we were cold. From 80 plus degrees to nearly 60 or less with a wind chill that was constant. Other hikers were caught in the rain as well. They were as confused as we were about the unexplained change in weather. We couldn't tell them what we saw. We couldn't even explain it to each other. We both knew we had seen her. We continued on the trail and never mentioned it. If any of you have heard of similar experiences in the area, please share. I want to try and identify this ghost, or whatever it was. Could it have been some crazy prank or a weather coincidence? Ike. The only creepy thing that's ever happened to me besides running into Bigfoot was one time on the Laurel Highlands hiking trail in Pennsylvania. It was my second day on trail, in the afternoon on a pretty nice partly cloudy day, and I was about to leave Ohio Pile State Park and enter State Game Lands number 111. I was having a good time and enjoying the hike. Ohio Pile is a great state park. I've been rafting there as well. I crossed Bidwell Road and went down an embankment into a bottomland landscape. It was a pretty mature forest and moist, soft soil, with a clear canopy and a fern layer on the floor. Areas where trees had fallen were the only areas that supported bushy growth. As soon as I got down the embankment, I looked up at this landscape and was suddenly seized with the strongest, grimmest fear I have ever experienced in my life. It was just sheer dread of impending doom. I looked very carefully at each of the hammocks to see if maybe I had subconsciously sensed a bear or if there were people around, but there was nothing. Just this repeating landscape of forest interspersed with bushy hammocks. It looked a little bit off, like video game tiles or something, and felt like maybe something horrible was waiting in one of the bushy areas to grab me. My instincts were unequivocally telling me that I needed to get the duck out of there. I actually backed up a couple of steps, not wanting to turn my back, and thought about trying to hike up the road, hitchhike out of there, and go home. I did not want to keep going. After a while, I managed to convince myself that I was being ridiculous and had to proceed. So I walked or jogged down the trail as fast as I could, being very vigilant. After a short while, the landscape changed, and I felt a hell of a lot better and was able to relax. I have no idea what it was, probably my mind playing tricks on me. But I've never felt that way at any time before or since. I've seen multiple bears and rattlesnakes run into creepy people on and off the trail and even been robbed at gunpoint once, in Chicago, but nothing has ever given me that kind of awful feeling. It wasn't fight or flight, it was just abysmal dread. This happened on my very first section hike, the 90 or so miles from Springer to Standing Indian Mountain. It was our final full day on the trail, and we were descending pretty hard, losing hundreds of feet per hour, and it was all rocks. We were jumping from rock to rock, it was very hard. Our legs hurt. Our feet hurt. We were moving slowly, but we had plenty of time to arrive at camp at a reasonable time. We had lunch at the final shelter a few hours ago, and on this long downhill stretch, we could see a couple of hikers heading up. We kept hiking down, they kept hiking up, and eventually we met them. It was an elderly couple with no pack, no gear, and nothing except a picnic basket with a small dog in it. The gentlemen sat down on a log, and we stopped and talked to them for a while. They said they were locals and were just heading up to the peak to watch the sunset. We wished them a good trip, and we kept hiking. We arrived at the campsite and did our thing, but it was basically already dark at that point, and that's when it hit us, 
How on earth are two elderly people with a dog going to make it five miles back down the mountain in the dark with absolutely no gear? We watched the trail coming down the mountain until 11 p.m., and no one ever came down the mountain. We went to bed and hoped they'd be okay. We woke up and started getting ready to head home, and a hiker we met at the final shelter yesterday showed up. We asked him if an elderly couple stayed at the shelter with him last night. He said, I left an hour or so after you, and then I just cowboy camped a few hundred feet up the trail from here. It got dark, and I wasn't sure how far away this campsite was, so I just hung my hammock and slept where I was. So we said, oh, okay, did you talk to the elderly couple when you passed them? I didn't pass a single hiker on my way down, it was just me the entire way. We tried to do a car inventory at the forest road, but there were about 10 cars, and we just had no way of knowing who they belonged to. But my hiking buddies and I love to tell this story and claim the elderly couple were ghosts, and they hike up the mountain every evening to watch the sunset. It just makes no sense, such an old couple hiking up the mountain that late in the day. And what about the poor dog in the picnic basket? Some mountain right after the dam pond, someone mentioned that a blue trail went to the top of the mountain and it was a great view, so of course I had to go, they said it was steep, that was an understatement. I went up to the fire tower looking for a flat spot, and an old dude came rolling up and said he was looking for rattlesnakes. Sure enough, he pointed out a few I had walked right by, and he asked if I was tenting there because there were probably another 50 in the weeds and brush. I was like, nope, so he told me about a stealth spot a few hundred yards down the gravel road. I checked it out, kind of buggy, but whatever. Right across from me is a very large tower with a building around it, so I figured I could probably find an outlet somewhere there in the morning. I knew there was a bear on the mountain that had been seen, and he was cruising the woods around me, but what are you going to do? He did an excellent bear hang and laid down, listening to some podcasts, but you could hear him banging around, so it was tough nodding off. I was just getting ready to get out of my tent and bang around some stuff, but all at once it felt like the mountain was shaking, like a huge fan and generator just cranked up at about 1am it was overwhelming, but then it settled into a deep roar, like the biggest box fan you ever heard. Well, I figured I love sleeping with a fan, and for sure, the bear was probably in the next county after that racket. So I had a beautiful night's sleep. I did not go near that tower the next morning to find an outlet, and I did mention it to a local the next day, and he gave me one of those. I probably shouldn't talk about that stuff, son. So I didn't. So not supernatural, but about as creepy and odd as they come. I did a day hike on Mount Tapulao during the month of February, all I knew was that it would be harder than the usual hike. We started at 4.30 a.m., it was pitch black. We're pretty much at the base still when our group meets a white owl, probably disturbed by the lights, and it flies off to a nearby tree. We decided not to follow but checked on the surrounding area where we were heading and found out that it was a cliff. Mind you, it was 11.59 p.m. in rural areas. We believed that Almighty protected us from harm, so we pushed on. I was part of the sweeper team, well, just us two and the guide, because one of my knees acted up, I got it from Mount Ugo. The guide told us a story about a mother and child, saying they're haunting kilometer four, with no rhyme or reason. This got us so scared and immediately hastened our phase. At times, our guide would walk too far away from us without a flashlight on, but he would be able to catch up. This is at 7 p.m. already, pitch black. There's also something odd about him that we couldn't pinpoint. While descending, my friend heard a child laughing, and so he started to pray. As I was about to look behind, I was explicitly told not to look behind until we got out of the mountain. I followed the instruction, and we got out. Some people said they saw entities at KM4 during the descent, I'm glad I didn't. We were told by our friends that we were almost tagged as missing at the base camp. Good thing they were there. I was hiking in eastern Washington with my husband and our friend on a trail that we had pretty much to ourselves, where we experienced some of the wildest things. There was an old abandoned cabin where the only things that remained were the door frame, the walls, and a fire pit made out of stone in the middle of it. We went inside of it for a couple of minutes, then started to feel a weird vibe as we left. The creepiest part of this trail is that we all saw another cabin in the distance that looked like it had a roof and everything there. We were excited and eager to explore it. However, when we started to approach it, the cabin slowly started to disappear as we got closer to it. When we got to it, it was just wooden beams. None of us could explain what happened because we all saw the cabin. There was a change in atmosphere in different parts of the trail that was so dramatic that it's hard to explain. There was an area that was so loud, there were areas that were eerily quiet, and it felt very unsettling. The end of the trail had new trees growing in, and it felt like we were in the same area for a while, even though it was two miles, because everything looked the same. 
This area made me feel so paranoid, and I felt something was watching us. I was terrified to look back. We all felt the shift in energy and booked it back to our cars. We were all spooked by this trail. There is something there that we cannot explain. I spoke to another person who went on this trail who also got weird vibes from it, so it's not just us. I go on a multi-day walk every summer, where I sort of set up a one-man tent at night. I've done it since I was a teenager, it's great fun. You just go into a thicket of trees or a more secluded field boundary and set up for the night. I'm surprised at how few scary encounters I've had. You'll occasionally be woken up by the sound of a dog sniffing around your tent, which will always be a badger, hedgehog, or something. But there's only been one time I was really confused by what happened. When I was about 17, I had set up in a small covey, probably at least two miles from the nearest village. I'd bedded down to about nine, and because it was the height of summer, it was still fairly light. But I get woken up at about 2 a.m. by the sound of whistling. Not tree whistling, spooky whistling, or anything like that. It was the sort of jaunty tune you'd hear from someone out on a nice walk or something. And I'm sitting up waiting for it to be a landowner, come to tell me to move on, which is always going to be a pain in the middle of the night, but then I realize how ducking stupid that sounds because it's two in the bloody morning, no landowners out and about at that time of night, much less whistling like it's a pleasant sunny morning. So I sort of sit and quietly listen, not daring to undo the zip in case it makes too much noise, and this whistling continues across the field by the covey and just disappears off into the distance. I still have no idea. I was stalked in the mountains last winter, so this isn't the first time something like this has happened. About a month ago, I hiked way, way up this mountain. It was a cold, cloudy day in October. I hiked up onto the peak of this mountain and was only a few minutes from the summit when I looked down and saw the person standing on one of the trails, I have eagle eyesight, and I'd seen this individual watching me on the way up. Red hoodie and black jeans. Upon further inspection, it looked like he was facing up at me. I didn't think this was too weird at the time, plus I was in the far upper regions of the mountain and he was much lower. On the way down, I saw him following a main trail towards the fork I was heading to. He stopped and stared. I didn't want to seem scared, so I took the trail in his direction. As I approached, I noticed he was speaking another language into his phone, but his screen was off, indicating he was faking his call. His body movements were strange. Very sporadic and exaggerated. He said something along the lines of, Hey, where are you going? I lied and said I was heading to a different part of the mountain range. Then he said he was waiting for his friend, and he went on in detail about how he doesn't know where his friend is. He even asked me if I'd seen him. Of course, I said no and that I had to go. He then took off down the way I'd just come. He was walking very fast, practically charging, as he continued to have this fake conversation. I never saw him after that. Am I being paranoid, or does this sound sketchy to anyone? This sounds like a scene from a horror story. And yes, it looked as if you were watching me the whole time. The weird interaction confirms it. I still have no idea how to explain what I felt, saw, and smelled. When I was a kid, I used to live on a farm out near a place called Munyanuka. Being a bored teen and the best friend to the most loyal farm dog ever, I would take my dog and go for walks every day. I loved the wildlife and even made some special connections with animals I had saved and rehabilitated. The end point for this walk was usually a natural spring we had on our property, and I loved to wet my feet and cool off when we got there. Duster loved it because of the water. As soon as we got close enough for him to swim but still keep an eye on me, he would bolt. The combined forces of heaven and hell, should they be real, couldn't stop him. It was a place I had been to nearly every week since I'd turned 13, and my old man trusted me not to do anything stupid, so I had walked it so many times I could do it in my sleep and not stray a single bit. On the afternoon it happened, I did the usual thing and walked the roughly 3 kilometers to the spring. But before we reached it, Duster froze and lit up like a power board. I could feel the tension coming off him, his hackles were raised, and he was whine growling. So naturally, I stopped dead in my tracks and had a good look. It all seemed normal, nothing seemed out of place. Then I smelled this overbearing stench of fish. To my knowledge, our spring fed into a water hole and didn't have large fish, small minnow-like ones at the most, but the smell was intense. Not like rotting fish, but more like a fresh fishy smell wafting directly at me. Duster behavior plus this smell made me freak out, and every hair on my body was on end, so I turned and started to leave. It all felt so wrong. As I did, I heard a low moo-like sound. It sounded like a pained cow. We didn't have cows. We were a sheep farm, just like our neighboring farmers were. The sound startled me, and I turned to see a small shrub, small enough so no cow could be obscured by it 
move and shake as if something were in or behind it. Duck me dead if I didn't run faster than I ever had or have since. And as soon as I bolted, Duster was with me, yelping like he'd been struck. I told my dad as soon as I got home, but he just fobbed me off with the reasoning that it must have been a cow or calf, and the smell must have been a punctured stomach or expelled gastrointestinal material. But I know what I smelled, and it wasn't awful or shit. I know what I saw, and it wasn't large enough to hide a cow. I know what I felt, and it felt like I was prey. One of our shearing guns that had been with us since I was a boy heard all about it from my dad, who had been teasing me about it since, and he pulled me aside. He told me to tell him everything, and I sat there expressionless until I finished. Then he told me that his tribe, he was a Yamachi man, had stories of the Deluga, also known as the Wawi or Yaoi, and that the white man's farms had pushed them out of the water holes that they live in. Spiteful and tricky, they would use mimicry to lure people to the water hole to drown and eat them. He said I did the right thing by running and that he would talk to his mob and let them know so they could chase the Deluga off with the traditional ways. He was adamant he wasn't teasing me, that he believed me because he could read it in my heart, the Deluga leaves a mark on those they sing to, and he told me not to go there until he told me it was safe again. And even then, never go without anyone else, because they are so tricky, they might even trick the elders into thinking they were successful in chasing it off. Now that I'm older, I still don't know what to think. I know what I saw and felt. I know Duster felt it too. But I just can't make my brain and my heart come to an agreement over it. My brain tells me that I was just a stupid superstitious boy, and my heart knows, just knows, that there was far more to it than jumping at shadows. I've never experienced anything else like that moment since that day, and it's been nearly 30 years. My family has since sold the land, and I've become a city boy. But if you were to invite me back there today to camp or swim, I'd tell you to go duck yourself and beg you not to go. I was going down through with three of my buds, PA, and it started to get late. We had thought we were going to come across a shelter or a spot to camp, but nothing was popping up, and it was getting dark. We came across a cabin that looked like it was straight out of the Evil Dead. One of those that you need a permit to rent out or something like that. There was a decent amount of space a little ways away from the cabin, so we thought, whatever, no one is staying in the cabin tonight, and we'll be gone early in the morning before anyone who would have rented it would arrive to find us. There was a sign post that said Dead Woman's Hello, which only added to the creepy ambience of the place, but nearby there was a little stream to pull water from, so we just laughed it off and set up camp. Around the stream, there was mud with paw prints in it, like a lot of them. My buds thought it was a dog, but I thought they were too different in size for it to have just been one dog and leaned more towards them being coyote tracks. I expressed my concerns, but was the odd man out? The rest of the group figured that even if they were, it was too late for us to pack up in the dark and just leave to hopefully find a new spot somewhere along the path. So night goes on, we all tuck in our bags and call it a night. About an hour later, we hear coyotes crying out just a few yards away. I called out and annoyed I told you so to the lads to rouse them from their sleep. Within the next hour, it was just a cacophony of coyote yelps and cries. We could hear them all night trotting around us and back into the brush. I had my knife and bear mace on me, but honestly, I slept like a baby. My buds, however, woke up pretty salty at their lack of a good night's rest with the commotion. I was hiking deep in the woods by myself, I know, dumb, but my buddy cancelled last moment and I went anyway, with my dog way off the popular trails on some small side trails when I noticed this weird guy following me about 300 to 400 yards back. I got a bad feeling from him right away, so I went down a different side trail that no one would normally go down as it's barely marked and doesn't go anywhere, then jogged for a couple hundred yards. I stopped by a bend in the trail, then dug behind a tree and took off my pack to get my hatchet out. Well, a few moments later, this same guy comes around the corner, looking around as if he's looking for me. We're about 8 miles from a road at this point, and the guy is wearing a stained jersey, a filthy hoodie, some ratty jeans, and dirty old tennis shoes. Not dressed like a backpacker. I step out from behind the tree, a hatchet casually at my side in one hand and a dog leash in the other. My dog is usually really sweet and loves attention from people but I clearly understood this guy was up to no good and started growling at him and getting into an aggressive stance. At this point, the guy notices me, and we lock eyes. He looks really agitated and a bit crazy, and he starts moving toward me. I think he was so messed up on whatever drugs he was on that he hadn't noticed the dog or the hatchet yet, so I let out my dog's leash, moved the hatchet around a bit to draw his eye, and said in as loud and commanding a voice as I could muster, Hey man, you lost or something? I guess his meth-soaked brain finally started working again to a degree because that's when he seemed to notice there was a very angry dog standing at his feet, giving him a ducking dare you look. He muttered something about trying to find the parking lot, 
So I gestured with my hatchet and told him, it's about eight miles behind you. I could tell he was sizing us up for a few moments and trying to decide if it was worth it. After a really long pause, he just turned around and started slowly walking in the other direction. I found out from a ranger later that he got caught breaking into cars in the parking lot and had been threatening other hikers with a knife. On a different hike in the same park about a year later, I ran into some juggalos who offered me free LSD. Shawnee National Forest is a beautiful but really strange place. When I was a teenager, me and my boy scout troop went to Chickamauga Battlefield for a camping trip. The trip was very nice, and it was interesting to learn the history of the battle, but the scoutmaster's wife was interested in the many reports of ghosts, orbs, and apparitions people had reported in the area. On our first night there, me and a buddy went to our campsite's bathhouse, and, on the way back, my buddy suddenly reached out and put his hand on my chest without saying a word. I looked up and saw an orangish light, like a candle or lantern, slowly flashing down the trail ahead of us. It rose up, flashed, then sank back down, repeating this pattern two more times as it went down the trail before disappearing. After it flashed the final time, we saw an identical orb streak down the trail, then another, and another. Once the third orb streaked by, everything was back to normal. We got on the trail and walked down it, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We didn't speak about it until we got back to the campsite. What I found really, really interesting was that this was on a gravel pathway no more than 15 feet away from us. It wasn't behind any trees and was in clear view. I have no idea what else it could have been as it looked just like a lantern light and it never went backwards, so this was four lights traveling in the same direction in a clear, unobstructed view of us. I cannot explain it as anything but some sort of supernatural occurrence. I live in a massive subdivision that surrounds a bunch of woods affectionately referred to as the trails. My friends and I were a resilient bunch who liked to go out there and have fires, get drunk, and smoke a little, if you know what I mean. So, considering we were out there so much, we decided we were going to build ourselves a little hideout or fort of sorts where we could party and even camp. We ended up with a good small clearing off one of the winding paths where we had set up a good-sized lean-to with some evergreen on top as our roof and named it Bear Cave. This happened back when I was about 17 to 19 years old. I had just gotten off work and had gone to grab some fast food. My friends had called me earlier, letting me know we were going to meet at Bear Cave. So after I got home, I changed into some warmer clothes, as this was late fall to early winter and it had been unusually cold that night. So I decided I should get out there as soon as possible and decided to take my food with me and eat there. It's about 8.30 and the moon is barely visible through the trees, but knowing the trail like the back of my hand, I wasn't worried and assumed they would already have a fire started. As I approached, I walked up to our hidden entrance and saw there was no fire and heard no sounds. I took my phone out and texted one, asking where they were. They replied something along the lines of, sorry, man, we're going to be about 15 minutes. Great. I thought to myself. I dove in and started trying to scrape together some wood and kindling to get something started. Unfortunately, everything was wet, and without a proper flashlight, this was before they were standard on phones, I couldn't get into the brush and dig anything up. Soon after, I decided I might as well eat and hurriedly scarf down my two burgers. Before I knew it, I had been sitting out there for about 20 minutes and still saw no sign of anyone. I tried giving a couple of them a call, and after 5 minutes with no call back, I texted them. Still no response. At this point, I was about fed up and my phone was about to die, so I made a mental note, 10 more minutes and I am gone. At this point, I squatted down, holding my knees to my chest, and tried getting warm. My back was to our little hut at the back of the site. I thought I heard something behind me, a slight crunch. I looked over my shoulder, and from behind the shelter, I saw what looked like two beady eyes glinting from the little moonlight entering through the trees. I quickly and quietly turned my full body to face it. At this point, I feel as though I am about to throw up or shit myself. But keeping my mind about myself, I slowly reached to my right, where I had laid a stick, just in case something like this might happen. If this was a dog, it was big, and let me just clarify, this was not a wolf, as I live in the south and coyotes do not get this big, something wasn't right. It just stared unblinkingly, as if through me, and made no sound whatsoever. I realized that whatever this was, it wanted to come at me. Thinking fast, I decided my best interest was to throw it off guard. I threw the stick, and without seeing if it made contact, I turned and ran swiftly out the entrance, expertly placing my feet in all the safe places through the trail, assuring I wouldn't trip while maintaining max speed. I didn't stop till I saw street lights and was safely on the road. About this time, I see my friends pulling up, and all I tell them is that I saw something. They didn't seem too interested and tried to go out. 
I told them sternly no and suggested we just go to my house. This seemed suitable to them, and so we went. I still don't know what I saw out there, and it was as though everyone forgot about it. I continued to go back out there, but only during the day or at night with a friend. But I will never forget those unwavering eyes. About 11 years ago, a big group of my friends, me, and their other friends got together to enter the woods at night. The woods were on a slope, so it was kind of like a hike too. The reason we wanted to do this was because once you reached the top, you would see the abandoned outside train station. The legend in our town was that a man was walking his dog, and he ended up getting hit by a train. His dog was dragged with him, and they died. So at night, you can apparently hear a train screeching and a dog barking. There was also a story about a girl haunting these woods. There were about 15 to 20 of us, so we all decided to split up into three groups. Now it was me and four other friends walking our own way up. We all seemed so at ease. Carelessly walking up, laughing, and messing about. We eventually reached the top, and we could see the train station on the right and houses on the left. We all crouched, stood quiet, and listened. After about two to three minutes of silence, we started whispering to each other about how it was a waste of time. One of my friends put his hand up and said, I think I heard something, so we stood, crouched, and went quiet. When nothing happened, we all looked at him, and as clear as day, we heard a girl giggle and say, hey. We instantly started running through people's backyards, hurtling fences taller than us out of pure adrenaline and fear of trying to get to the street. I somehow ended up running my own route alone. I didn't even care. I ran down this hill, and the street lights cut off halfway down. It was like a movie. I was running straight into pitch black darkness. As I entered the void, it was just more houses and more hills. But as soon as I breached the darkness, I heard the same giggling as if she were on my back. I kept running, and eventually I saw everybody at the bottom together. I was so relieved. I will never do something like that again. This is really hard to articulate without sounding like an absolute crackpot, but here goes. When you go walk about in the bush or the outback, a lot of the time there's a slight niggling sensation that you're being watched. This can be alarming for some, especially those that spend very little time away from cities and suburbia, but it's definitely not malevolent, it's just curious. A wody wody man explained to me that the bush does watch, listen, and evaluate our actions within it, and naturally I was incredibly skeptical. He just said that the land is looking out for us and subtly guiding us to make thoughtful decisions. He could tell I was unconvinced and followed up. Have you ever been walk about and felt eyes on your neck when no one was around to see? Have you ever made a split second decision that you couldn't rationalize that resulted in a huge net positive for yourself or someone else? Have you ever been subconsciously prompted to take a specific direction that's resulted in a huge discovery? Ever almost had a huge accident but got lucky? Sure enough, I realized this was true, at least for myself, and my expression must have changed because the black fella broke out into a huge grin and started to laugh. You're connected to the land, the dreaming, and the ancestors. They're all looking out for us. I will never forget that, even though I don't fully agree or still hold reservations about the cause. Whatever it is, I went out that night with the express intent to watch and listen and came across a clearing on a clear night with a new moon, so naturally I looked up. The stars were more beautiful than I've ever seen before or since in my entire life. I must have spent a couple hours just laying there in the dirt, having a big old thought. So yeah, if you can believe it, the land is looking out for us. If you don't believe it, I'd assert that it's been too long since you've been outside of the city or suburbia, and you need to take some time to look at some stars to remember what it's all about. I was on my northbound through hike heading for Duncannon, Pennsylvania. Somewhere 10 miles or so from Duncannon, I encountered picnic tables near the Appalachian Trail. I moseyed on over to the picnic tables and met a group of senior women from the Duncannon area who were out for a day hike and sitting at one of the picnic tables. They were friendly and invited me to sit down with them and ask if I was a through hiker. Somewhere during the conversation, the ladies asked me where I was staying that night, and I told them I probably wouldn't make it to Duncannon. I got out my data book and mentioned the shelter I was probably going to stay at instead of going on into Duncannon. One lady got serious and said, you should go all the way into Duncannon. No reason is given. Then another lady in the group said, yeah, it'd be best if you went into Duncannon tonight. The conversation headed elsewhere, and I eventually had to get going, thanking the ladies for their company. The shelter I stayed at was about 3.5 miles or so south of Duncannon. The Appalachian Trail Handbook said that the shelter location actually had two shelters. Also, the water source below the two shelters had a steep decline. Finally, the Appalachian Trail Handbook said Earl Schaffer, the first person to have through hiked the Appalachian Trail, had personally built the two shelters. 
I've met Earl on a couple of occasions, so I headed downhill toward the two shelters. On the way downhill, I briefly wondered why those ladies were advising me to go on into Duncannon rather than staying in a shelter for the night. At the location of the two old shelters Earl Schaffer had built, I noticed another grandiose new shelter was under construction too. The ends of the wooden beams on the shelter under construction had carved faces. It looked to me like one of those faces was Earl's. No matter, I went over to the two old shelters, choosing the one closest to the shelter trail, and set up my sleeping bag. The floorboards were just round logs tied together and sat only a foot or so above the ground. A little unusual, but with those two shelters being that old, maybe that was the way shelters were built way back when. I was lounging on the end of the round logs, relaxing, and deciding whether I was going to go down to the water source. That's when it first hit me. Wow, there is something very spooky about this shelter. To get my mind off the spookiness, I started thinking about something else, next day planning, whether I was going to do a zero day in Duncannon, that type of thinking. The spookiness would return. I couldn't figure it out. Oh well, time to hit the sack. I woke up the next day, and the spookiness was still there. I packed up and headed into Duncannon for the day. There in town, I called my mail drop support person, and in the conversation, I mentioned the shelter I had stayed at the night before and how spooky it was there. She asked me something to the effect of, did I know why? I said no. She said, that's where those through hikers were killed a few years ago. That stunned me. The way it was told to me, two through hikers, a southbound man and woman, had gone into a bar in Duncannon, and they'd had a conversation with another bar patron. They'd mentioned the Appalachian Trail and that they were southbounders. The normal kind of conversation an Appalachian Trail hiker would have with a town person. Eventually the through hikers got their stuff ready, and with the sun going down, they headed south to the shelter I had stayed at the night before. They were in their sleeping bags when that patron from the bar showed up, shot, and killed both of the through hikers. The murderer took their gear and started south on the Appalachian Trail. There's more to the story, but I won't go into that. I went back to that shelter years later. The two old shelters were removed, and the newer shelter was ready and being used by hikers. I met a pass through hiker, and just in conversation, he mentioned to me the discord that had happened at the ceremony for making the new shelter available for hikers. I won't go into the details of that ceremony, but I am still concerned about how Earl was treated at the ceremony and before. Later, as I moved northward, I felt a similar spookiness at Pierce Pond Shelter in Maine. A beautiful place during the autumn. I have no idea why that place was spooky to me. Magnolia Springs State Park in Georgia Friends and I were camping there for the weekend, and one particular night I was awoken to some strange noises in the woods. To preface, this land that the park is situated on is steeped in American and Native American history. It was a focal point and settlement for many different people for hundreds of years. The allure was the natural cold springs that could provide fresh, clean water for a whole army or community to drink. Needless to say, there are many stories dating from the Civil War and even earlier about strange happenings in and around the park. It seems only natural because of how long it has been inhabited. Anyway, my wife and I were sleeping in a tent right next to the edge of the wood line. I was awoken around 2 or 3 a.m. to a loud sound that almost sounded like mechanical noise in the woods, way off in the distance. It sounded like metal on metal. It reminded me of hearing that a train yard was fully operational during the day and loading train cars. It was very odd because the next day, when I was around the grounds, I saw a park ranger and asked him if there were any factories or train tracks in the vicinity that could explain these strange noises. He replied, No, sir, you heard it, huh? This is when I knew that this was an unexplained occurrence that happens a lot in the middle of the woods out there. This had to have been several years ago, I remember being in my early 20s, coming from the JAX airport, and going back home to Albany, Georgia. We left around 7 to 7.30 and got on the highway. My stepdad was driving, and we were talking, listening to music, and enjoying the ride. After an hour or two, it was pretty much pitch black everywhere. This is where things got a little weird. So the first strange event was the radio cutting off on its own. We were listening to some tunes, and it just cut off. No car issues, no low battery. I pressed all the buttons on the radio console and got nothing. At that point, we just said screw it, we were too tired at that point to worry about the radio and just wanted to get home. Mind you, where we were was pretty much farmland and roads at this point. All of a sudden, a huge white light just appeared out of nowhere, focusing on the car from above. TBH. I didn't think anything of it. I thought maybe it was a helicopter, maybe looking for someone via strobe light. I really started to get concerned because the light shining down on the car had pinpoint accuracy, as it didn't bobble or shift at all. 
Laser focus. To add to the confusion, I heard no such noise from the skies. Nothing but the silence of the night and the hum of driving on the highway I just had to ask the obvious to my stepdad. Do you see the light on the car, Mike? Yeah, he replied, sounding unsure. The next thing I do is put down my window and look up. I just had to know. When I looked up, the light was quite blinding, but I was only able to identify that there was something above us and flying clearly to keep up with us. We were going about 75 miles per hour, I am still dead silent as I question what is putting this light on us and why. A few minutes went by, and the real fear started to settle in on the inside because it had not left and was just creepy. And just like that, the light turned off, the blackness of the night road returned, with the high beam still on, and the radio immediately cut back on as if nothing happened. Me and my stepdad didn't really know what to say, but we were glad that we were okay. I told Mike that mom wasn't going to believe us. I wish I had more than the memory of a moment in my life to show you all this. It is up to you to believe the truth in my story. I will never forget that night coming home. I went walking at about 1am as a dumb teenager. No drugs. No vandalism. No wanking. There are no criminal intentions whatsoever. I went out just to see if I would get scared. There was not a soul around, it was a new moon, so there was no light except for a few buildings way off in the distance. The buildings didn't light anything up, they just gave me a reference point against the dark abyss. I remember feeling very freaked out initially, but then after about 5 minutes of snapping sticks and hearing bird calls, I calmed down and chilled. In the bush. In the dark. Alone. It was meditative at first. I finally had uninterrupted time to think about school and my future. It was a nice vibe away from all the people and car noises of the daytime. Every so often, I got caressed by a soothing breeze filtering through the trees, and the smell of eucalyptus almost put me to sleep. I was just about ready to call it a night and walk home, but all of a sudden I had a primal fear wash over me. The sort of fear that feels like somebody is pouring cold water down your spine. The fact that I couldn't see a meter past my face didn't help. I didn't know what to do. I was so chilled out just prior that I thought maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I'm usually a fighter, but that night I was frozen in fear, sitting at the base of a tree. I was too scared to even uncross my legs for fear of making a sound. I was convinced I was being watched from somewhere. Every twig that fell from a tree and every branch flapping and the wind got my full attention after that. Eventually, I heard the unmistakable sound of a stick getting walked over. That was the impetus to force me to stand. I couldn't tell what way the sound came from over the wind, so I had to stand there distraught, waiting another agonizing moment for the next footstep to be heard, all the while the person I was convinced was approaching could have already been staring directly at the back of my neck. Another snap of a twig came from my right. It was as if somebody was trying to foxwalk up to me, but the ground was too cluttered. I took off to my left, but for some reason my terrified brain didn't want to walk too fast, lest the noise behind me know I was onto them. Sure enough, the fox walking stopped, and then I heard regular footsteps. There was definitely somebody behind me, I just didn't know who or why they were there. I'm a fast walker, so I had no problem picking up the pace. The footsteps picked up too, so eventually, as I'm heading further into the darkness, I convince myself that the footsteps were just an echo of my footsteps and that I had failed my test of not being scared in the bush. Nope. The footsteps continued and got closer and closer. It was completely black, I couldn't see a thing, but for a split second, as I looked behind me toward the building lights in the distance, I saw a bald male silhouette briefly step into view. There was absolutely somebody there now, without a doubt. At that point, I bolted down a hill toward a nearby parking lot. The man didn't follow me after I ran, but I looked behind me as I got under some streetlights, and I could just make out his silhouette against the city lights. I stopped once I was about 200 meters away. He was a bald and surprisingly fat guy, given that he made very little sound walking on rugged soil. He just stood there, arms by his side. I couldn't see his face except for his ears. He was wearing a t-shirt and track pants. He was looking in my direction, if not directly at me. It felt like we made eye contact, which was too much for me, so I looked away briefly at where I was going to run, and when I turned back, he had disappeared off the hilltop. That feeling you get when a cockroach or rodent vanishes without you noticing pales in comparison to the dread you will feel when you lose track of a creepy person. I ran so fast home that there would have been a blurry streak on any nearby security cameras. To this day, I don't know what that guy's plan was. Maybe he was mentally ill, or maybe he was also just chilling in the bush. I was still a kid, so maybe his plan was to molest me or assault me. I also don't know how he could so easily see me. I'd been in the dark for at least 30 minutes, so maybe he had some NVGs with him or something. Ducking weird, man. 
I never saw the bloke after that, although I never did go back to the area at night. I used to do some off-track bush slash beach camping with friends during high school, I think we were 16 to 17 at the time. One mate couldn't stay the night, so a friend and I decided we'd walk him along the 30-minute track to his car when he left at around 2 a.m. since he didn't want to do it alone. If it weren't for the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Halfway along the track heading as we reached a part of the trail with a large dip in it, I heard sticks lightly crunching in the bush and could have sworn I had seen a large man-shaped figure silhouetted against a clearing crouching, attempting to conceal themselves in the bush roughly 5 meters off the trail while looking towards us. I told myself it was my mind playing tricks on me, and I just picked up the pace a little. When we reached the car and were saying goodbye to the mate heading home, I thought I'd have a little fun and spook him by telling him I'd thought I'd seen something skulking in the bush as we walked but hadn't told him at the time, knowing it would freak him out. To my dismay, the mate who would be walking back with me chimed in, saying he'd seen the exact same thing. I thought he might be trying to mess with me, and so I asked him where he'd seen it, and he replied, to the left of the path where the trail dips and the bush clears up a bit, but what he told me next truly made my heart sink. He said that after noticing I'd picked up the pace, he looked back over his shoulder and caught the glare of the moonlight bouncing off a pair of eyes where we'd seen the silhouette. We were both on edge, walking back torches on full blast and talking loudly, but when we got the dip in the trail, we couldn't help but peer towards where we'd seen the figure. The clearing was bare, and it was unmistakable that the shadow we'd seen before was gone. There wasn't much sleep on that trip. The following experience took place in late June of 2010. I was in the small town of Oma, Mississippi. There's a place we call the camp, a 115-year-old house situated along the Pearl River. I do not know how many families have lived here or what lives on or around the property. I have also seen some sort of odd creature, maybe Bigfoot. Anyway, again, this house is fairly old, and anything could be haunting the place. My parents were asleep in a room down the hall. I was laying on a bottom bunk bed in the kids' room, where the kids sleep when they stay there. I had my earphones in my ears, listening to music on my iPod. The room I was in was dark, but the light in the kitchen was on, and the door was open with the foot of the bed facing the door. I had a view out into the hallway, which was partially lit. What I saw next really made me jump. As I was listening to my music, suddenly I saw a white figure about six feet tall pass in front of the door. I found that weird, as I knew everyone was asleep. At first, I thought someone had broken into the house, and I hadn't heard it over the music. This frightened me, and I quickly took off my earphones. Upon listening, I heard nothing. Still, I sat quietly and as still as possible. Then I saw it again. But it was coming across the same way, almost repetitively. I decided I had to see what this was. Shakingly, I tiptoed over to the door. Looking around, I saw nothing. I quickly walked to the kitchen. No one is there. I walked to the bathroom. I was in a cold sweat. The bathroom closet was open, which I found strange, no one had used it after me, and the closet door had not been open then. My parents were asleep, and I almost assumed that someone had broken in. I turned to look at the front door to make sure the lock and wooden board were still across it. It was. I knew someone had not been in there. Breathing a sigh of relief, I started for my room. I then realized that what I had seen was no person. It was a ghost. I didn't sleep for much of the night after this. I still get chills from this. So I'm not sure if this goes like a ghost story or an encounter with some other type of creature. But anyway, I grew up and have lived most of my life on a small farm way out in the rural parts of Norway I call home. My childhood home was situated so that we looked straight down on the fjord below, and we had dense pine woods and rolling mountains looking down on our home from the back of the house. It is about a four-hour drive to get anywhere near what can be called a major town or the like. I spent much of my teens out in the woods, accompanied by our dog, and generally just doing the things teens and kids do when you have too much time on your hands. So when I turned 16, I got my first shotgun and hunting permit. It was early September, and I had a day off from school, so I got a backpack packed with a day worth of food and such from my mom and took my dog along for a day of hunting grouse along an old logging trail that leads into the mountain valleys. I hiked for about two hours, and myself and my dog saw absolutely no signs of game. So we took a break near the remains of a long abandoned sawmill. While I was eating my lunch and patting my dog, a low and somewhat guttural yelp echoed down the trail, followed by a similar yelp coming from behind me. At this point, I thought it was a fox or a roe deer. Those animals make odd sounds, so I thought nothing of it. Until my dog started whimpering, she was a large hunting dog, a German long-haired retriever mixed with a Norwegian grey moose hound, who normally did not lose her nerve, so yeah, 
16-year-old me became a bit more alert at this point. I packed up and started off again when my dog went full-on mentally, growling and barking. In my teenage mind, I thought, oh hell. A moose must be near. But no moose or other woodland creature emerged. So I pull her with me, gripping her leash firmly. We go about a mile further along, and when I hear this low, guttural sound that halted me mid-step, the sound is accompanied by a strange scent of something akin to a mixture of peat and an old smelly animal of some sort, the sort of odor of a really old dog or old goat. I look around, nervous and worried. Because no animal I knew of made such sounds or smelled like that. I slid the safety of my shotgun and felt very, very much like I was about to see what sort of irate animal was warning me to back off. My dog stood frozen and just glared into the woods, some 40 meters to my left, her teeth bared and growling, in something akin to fear. As we stood there, I got this feeling that this was not a place to linger, so I lowered my gun, flicked the safety back on, and ran like a whipped horse the way I had come. As I did this, I could have sworn I heard the dim sound of laughter. I ran all the way home, and when I reached the fields next to our home, I vomited from the strain and sheer fear. My dad saw me bent over and puking my guts out and hurried to meet me, he thought I had gotten sick or something like that. Not wanting to admit being afraid of some forest animals, I told him that I had been feeling a bit sick since my lunch break. But I think he saw my face and knew something else was afoot. I never went hunting alone in that part of the woods again. I feel like this scene traumatized me since I remember it so well whenever I think about fear. The reason this memory scares me to this day is probably because I have yet to discover what animal it was. My closest bet would be raccoons, but the uncertainty is what frightens me so much. That day I decided to push a bit more, and even though I was at a shelter with my trail family and it was dusk, I just wanted to keep moving and hike to the closest camp spot ahead. We've been there before. I waited out the momentary rain in the shelter and started hiking moments before it actually got dark. My buddy told me not to drink the water from one of the water sources ahead because apparently there was a factory accident or something contaminated the stream or river. I remember going downhill from that shelter, crossing that stream, and then having to cross a highway that was pretty wide, it had a thickly wooded median strip. At this point, I was ready to pitch my tent anywhere, but the surroundings didn't permit that, so I kept going. I got into a woody section of the trail, where everything around my headlamp was pitch dark. The headlamp, by the way, had an issue. Most likely, because of the weak battery, it would dim itself, and I would have to reset it. It was enough to see where my next step was going, so I just kept it dim. This is when I encounter a pair of eyes reflecting back at me from the right, nothing out of the ordinary when night hiking, could be anything really. The eyes were medium size, 4 to 5 inches apart, 4 feet off the ground. Right next to them were another pair of eyes, but slightly smaller and shorter. My first thought was actually bear cubs, because the way they acted really reminded me of curious cubs mesmerized behind their mama. I just let them be and focused on moving forward, and this is when I saw it. One, two, three, more of them. All slightly varying in size, and this time on my left. I grabbed my trekking pole, a clever name I made for a modified trekking pole the size of a stake, and started banging it on a tree. The eyes didn't move at all and just stared back at me. Fine, I kept moving while I banged the passing by trees with my poke, and then as the trail turns right, in front of me, I see this line of about a dozen pairs of eyes, all of them just sitting there in the outlines of the trees without moving one bit. This is when the fear started flowing, so I picked up my pace and turned right, ignoring any glare in my peripheral vision. I just stormed the hell out of there. Soon I was out of that section, and I managed to make it to a pond where I stealth camped. Whenever I would tell others about this, they would shrug it off, thinking that I'm probably exaggerating or that it was nothing serious, but experiencing it firsthand all alone, knowing that you're greatly outnumbered, was hella scary. I wonder if anyone else has had similar experiences that they can't get out of their minds either. July 2006, England. Every year, my best friend and I go away for a night of ghost hunting. Ostensible, it's an excuse to get away from our respective kids and spouses, but on one trip, we were scared silly. We'd done our research and headed to Oxney Bottom on Deal slash Dover Road in Kent. We grabbed a pint and a pie from a local pub and discussed our route. Whether it was obvious by our equipment or because we were clearly down from London, my friend is black and rural England is almost entirely white, the barman suddenly asked if we'd come to see the ghost. We cautiously answered in the affirmative. Suddenly, the otherwise quiet locals who had been eavesdropping all descended on us and tried to tell us their stories about the famous grey lady. Most tales were second-hand. The only story I remember was from a middle-aged chap who told us that as a teenager, he'd fastened a washing line across the road, and every time a car came past, 
he'd pull a bed sheet from one side to the other. He had thought this was hilarious until the local police, who had been inundated with terrified drivers, cautioned him and sent him home. So, in good humor, we set off on a lovely summer's evening down the road. We sat in some woods, chatting, and not taking the whole thing particularly seriously. After a few hours, we decided to head back to the campsite. But before we did, we thought we'd just wander up a gravel road off the main highway. At that time of year in England, night falls quite late. There was still some light in the sky, but beneath the trees, it was dark. That's when I saw something. I can only describe it as a white, roughly human-sized column of cloud. The weird thing was that I didn't feel at all scared. I was thinking there was grease on my contact lenses, but no matter how much I blink, the shape does not go away. Can you see that? I asked, turning to my friend, who was looking behind. What? He asked, but when I looked forward again, I could see nothing. So, we continued walking. And lo and behold, I can see the cloud again. It was about 20 meters in front of us, not coming towards us directly but at something of an oblique angle, our paths crossing. Again, I was not scared, as I was thinking there's definitely dirt on my contact lenses. At this point, my friend shouts, what the duck is that? And now, I'm scared because I know something is really there. I turned on the huge flashlight we'd bought for the mission, but my friend said, turn it off. Turn it off. So I did, only to find our night vision ruined. There was no light in the sky, just suffocating darkness. All I remember is hearing my friend breathing heavily. Eventually, our eyes adapted, and we debated going back to camp or continuing. My friend argued that no matter how scary, this is what we'd come for, and we should carry on. Reluctantly, I agreed. We reached the top of the hill, where we met three very real humans, one man and two women. We told them our story and asked them why they were in the woods at night. They described themselves as paranormal investigators. I thought they were a bit weird as they did certain spiritual, cleansing, rituals. We wished them luck in their investigations and walked back to our campsite, about two miles away. We felt nervous at every dark spinny, but nothing happened on the walk home. Several years ago, a friend and I went on a multi-day hiking trip during the winter. While preparing for the trip, I found a forum dedicated to the trail we'd be hiking about people going missing on it. Most of the members blamed the hikers themselves, saying they were most likely inexperienced, would-be adventurers who had gone off trail and gotten lost. There was one old man on the forum who claimed he'd completed the trail once a year for the past 50 or so years, and he believed there was something more sinister behind these disappearances. Naturally, the other members laughed at him. We set off before sunrise to get as many miles in as possible on the first day. That entire day, we only met one other person, a friendly middle-aged man who lived somewhat locally. He seemed impressed that we were taking on the trail in winter and even invited us to camp near his property, but we declined and pressed on. That night, we were surprised by some pretty dangerous terrain around the edge of a lake and took the decision to sleep in our bivy sacks under an overhanging rock. Not exactly ideal camping conditions, but given the potential hazards, we felt this was the smartest choice. I don't sleep well at the best of times in a bivy sack, and if you've ever been zipped into one, you'll know how claustrophobic it can feel. The rock hanging over my head didn't help either. A few hours after I did eventually manage to fall asleep, I woke suddenly to the sound of my friend shouting and swearing at me. I popped my head out of my bivy and saw that he was still zipped inside his, had someone gotten off the relatively level ground we had been sleeping on, and was slowly sliding down towards the lake. I quickly got up and dragged him, with great effort, back up to the level ground. He was absolutely furious with me, claiming that he'd felt me drag him, but soon calmed down and accepted that he'd most likely rolled over repeatedly in his sleep. We didn't go back to sleep and instead had some coffee and breakfast while waiting for the sun to come up. When we did set off, it started to rain heavily and didn't stop for most of the day. I was also having some trouble with an old injury in my leg, which slowed us down considerably. The sun seemed to disappear rather suddenly near the top of a deceptively steep hill, so we set up camp there and then, this time in a tent. After the rough couple of days we had, we were grateful to be inside a tent, and the ground underneath us was actually not too bad. We talked and joked about the trip so far, and for some reason I remember my friend expressing his disappointment that he'd forgotten to pack his iPad, and then we tried to sleep. Soon after, I began to hear what sounded like human footsteps. I thought to myself, surely there isn't someone else out here climbing this hill at night? The sound continued, and the more intently I listened, the more I became certain of what I was hearing. I poked my head out of the tent, and the sound stopped. I got out to pee and looked around, not a soul in sight. Shortly after getting back into my sleeping bag, the footsteps started again, and this time they started circling our tent. 
By this point, I was pretty frightened, and I asked my friend, are you hearing this? He responded, yes, I ducking am. Knowing that he'd been hearing them the entire time and that they sounded as freaked out as I did genuinely terrified me. We got out of the tent again and asked if anyone was there, but again, there was no one around, and the sound had stopped instantly. The footsteps around the tent continued for quite some time, and we didn't sleep. As soon as the sun came up, we packed up our things, got off the trail, hiked to the nearest village, got a cab to the nearest town, and made our way home. We have never been able to find a convincing explanation of what could have been causing the sound of the footsteps that night, and my friend has since become a full-fledged missing person, paranormal, and conspiracy enthusiast. It is not my story, but I will retell it as best I can. Mate was hitching from Canberra to Melbourne and found himself near some bush near Gundagai. He is a modern-day swaggy type guy and always spends time in the bush by himself, survival style. He loves it. It was getting dark, and he knew he wouldn't get picked up, so he started to think about setting up for the night. There was bush on one side of the road, so he headed in a few meters where he could set up a swag, camp, and not be bothered by any nighttime traffic. He had to cross a wire fence to do so, but from where he set up, he could see the road. After a while, just before the light was gone, a police car showed up, with lights on but no siren, and stopped directly in front of him. He laid low and hoped he wouldn't be seen. Started getting paranoid that he might be on private property and had been seen and dobbed in. A few minutes later, a second cop car arrives and parks behind the first. Cops get out and chat. He couldn't hear what they were saying, but he was getting really nervous. A few minutes later, from the other side of the road, way over the paddocks and hills, the other side of the road wasn't bush, if you recall, he saw a huge orange orb of light. It moved across the land silently, toward the cops. I went directly over them, not very high on the ground, and carried on, over my friend and his swag, off into the night. The cops got back in their cars and drove off. He spent the night there and headed off the next morning. He told me this story, and not a day goes by that I don't think about it. When I was 14, I went camping in the summer with the girl guides. We only traveled a few miles away to a place we had visited a few times for game nights. Each year, our guides would merge with the two others in the area for a huge campout for around five days. The place we were staying in was rumored to have a ghost in the main house, the story says it only shows itself to members of the family. We were staying on the large estate near the woods, right away from the house. I had been there quite a lot and knew the grounds pretty well, which was awesome. I was staying in a tent with the younger girls, ranging in age from 10 to 13, because I didn't have my own tent like the other older girls. The first day and night went smoothly, we built a climbing frame, lit candles in the dark, and pretended we had landed on an alien planet, a silly fun game, it is part of the story later. The next morning, me and one of the other girls got up early. Our group's job was to collect firewood for breakfast, so we ventured into the woods on our own. We were joking around, grabbing wood as we walked. We ended up at the obstacle course and decided to play on it for a while, even though it was out of bounds. When we were done, we grabbed the firewood and started walking back to camp. To me, the woods felt and looked strange. It was as if the place was slightly different. I decided to start trying to scare the girl I was with, just messing around and trying to spook her because it was fun. She got spooked, ran off, and left me behind. I wasn't bothered as I slowly walked back, that was when I saw movement to my left, then again up ahead. As I was about to leave the woods, I saw a man out of the corner of my eye. He was wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, carrying something long. I think it was a shotgun. There was no one there. I just shrug it off. Stuff like that doesn't bother me, I've seen strangers. Once out of the woods, everything went back to normal. I looked back, and the woods were as they should have been, not like they were a few moments ago. I don't know how to explain it, they just seemed newer for a while, not as wild, I guess, but everything was kind of grainy, misty, I guess, but there was no mist. So I don't say anything more, I enjoy the camp out, we play games, sing songs, and just have fun. On the second to last day, we play a game. We had landed on the alien planet, and once we had breakfast, we had to go hide in the woods, build a shelter, and build a fire to make food. People had to go steal food from the campsite without being seen. I have been left in the woods on my own for ages as the other girls go about getting food. I built a pretty awesome shelter, but I realized I needed my pen knife, which I had left in my tent, so I went to get it. I get to the tent to find the kids I was sharing it with crying their eyes out, terrified. I eventually got the story out of them. They had been making their food when a man wearing a white shirt and cap appeared and then vanished in front of them, where I had seen him. I assured the kids that it was fine and that it couldn't hurt them, 
and they eventually went back into the woods, but they were seriously shaken. I got the blame for telling them a scary story, but I had only tried to scare one girl at the very start and hadn't mentioned anything about the man to anyone. That night was the campfire. As it ended, we all ran through the pitch black woods back to camp, leaving the person looking after us all alone in the woods. She had a light, so no big deal. She had to make sure the fire was out. I found out a week later that she had been terrified walking back to camp and refused to go into the woods again after that. She has refused to camp at that site ever since, but she won't tell us what she saw. The last day, I got bored packing up, and after everything that had happened, I was in a ghost hunting mood. So me and two other girls go into the woods. I'm in the lead, and I'm walking along a path. I stopped walking and heard footsteps in front of us. There were clear footsteps walking on dead leaves, but there were none. No one was walking anywhere near us. I followed the sounds along a path. Someone had heavy boots on, it was so strange. We all had trainers on. The girls I was with were silent, they could hear it as well. I followed the sounds around to a clearing at the very edge of the woods, where they stopped. I decided to sit down on the grass. The other girls followed me, but they sat behind me because they were scared at this point. I do the whole if there is anyone here, can you give me a sign routine? As I finished, a white mist suddenly fell over the woods. You could see things moving behind it, but nothing was clear. It hung in the air as the other two girls ran off screaming. I sat for a minute and watched it before saying, thank you. As I said, it was like a gust of wind hitting, and it was gone. There was no wind. It was just awesome. That was the last of the strange stuff for that camp. We had to finish packing up and leave the camp that afternoon. I've been back a few times since, and nothing strange has happened. The woods have always felt normal since then. A few years after that, I found out that I was actually related to the family who owned the house and estate. I'm always curious if the activity picked up because I was staying on the grounds. This was on one of my first solo backpacking trips in the Spring Mountains in southern Nevada. My plan was to do Mount Charleston in two days, spending the night, then bagging the peak and heading down the next day. If you haven't been there, the trail is gorgeous. It winds up around the rim of a big valley before veering up to the summit ridge and offering just some awesome views. About two miles into the ascent, a faster hiker overtakes me. Rather than just nod and continue on, he stops and matches pace with me, and we strike up a conversation. Nothing particular was weird about what we talked about, but something was just a little off about him. He was too intense and too friendly. Same kind of artificial friendliness. He was too type A, too glib. It was almost like he was imitating a genuine reaction. I recall him telling me that he really liked challenging himself but felt sick because nothing really felt hard or exciting anymore. Nothing really made him hard like it used to, to paraphrase. Well, the vibe was really freaking me out, so I made an excuse to stop for lunch. The dude kept hiking, and I thought that was the end of it. I had an awesome rest of the day, and as I hiked, he slipped further from my mind. I found a gorgeous campsite on a promontory jutting off from the valley wall and settled in for the night. As night fell, as happens to all of us when we're alone in the backcountry, I started getting squirry as hell. Full-blown jitters, man. My mind kept jumping back to how weird that guy was and how he acted like something a regular human should act like. To make it worse, I was cowboy camping. Not even the dubious protection of nylon between me and the potential of seeing a smiley guy. So in order to ease my anxious mind before going to bed, I set my fixed blade knife in easy reach, right next to my head. I eventually got to sleep after listening to a few episodes of Mike Duncan's The History of Rome podcast. I slept unusually soundly, not waking once the whole night. When I woke in the morning, I felt unusually content and well rested. That is, until I went to grab my stove out of my pack. The location of my pack wasn't an issue. It was where I had left it, leaning against a pine about 5 feet from my pad. No. What really freaked me out was that every single pocket was open. All the zippers are unzipped. All the snap closures were unwrapped. The sleeping back compartment was open. The interior mesh compartments were open. The buckle closures on my stuff sacks were clicked open inside the bag. Nothing was taken, and the bag hadn't been moved. But literally every pocket was open. I wigged, dude. I had made sure they were all closed the night before. I'm fastidious with my gear. Someone had opened them. In panic, I looked down to where my knife lay on the ground, next to my pad. Sure enough, the snap closure that held it to its sheath had been snapped open. Let me tell you, brother, I set the ducking land speed record hauling asses off that mountain. This happened to my sister and me when I was about 15, F, and she was about 18. We went walking in this little forest at the side of an estuary. 
I use the term forest loosely because most of the trees are more like rough shrubs. Some are as short as our knees, and the tallest are probably only 6.5 to 7 feet high. The trail is constructed of boards to keep you on track, and you aren't really supposed to veer off because the land has a delicate ecosystem. Besides, the shrubs are rough and can be thorny. So we're walking along, shooting the breeze, light chatter, nothing spooky or anything. We got down to where the shrubs are highest and close to the trail. I started noticing the shrubs rustling. At first, I didn't think much of it, like maybe there was a bunny and it got startled and fled once we walked by. But it kept happening. Even weirder, it seemed to be following us, getting closer, rather than being something we stumbled upon. We started to walk faster. The rustling kept up with us. I considered that maybe it was some kids messing with us, but like I said, the vegetation was very thick, and it would be hard to keep up with someone on a clear trail that quickly. We came to a fork, one path led down to a lookout over the estuary, the other back up the trail to the shorter shrubs, and eventually the road back to our house. Every tree at the fork was shaking, but not simultaneously. It was completely random. I am Catholic, but my sister has Wiccan-based spiritual beliefs. She tried some of the protection chants she'd heard. Nothing changed. I was so scared, I told her to do it again. She did. Finally, she shouted it, and we held hands and ran up the trail as fast as we could. A little way up the trail, a couple of women were headed down, they did not seem to acknowledge my sister screaming Wiccan babble, and my sister later stated that she could tell from their eyes that they were fairy folk, whatever that means. We made it home without any further incidents. I called my best friend and recalled everything that happened to her. She was amused and asked if I would take her there. By this time, I had started to talk myself out of it. It was the wind, some rowdy, creepy kids, and our imagination. A couple days later, my sister, me, and my BFF, also 15, returned to the forest. This time we went out to look out over the estuary. To my horror, the bushes began shaking again. This was different because these bushes weren't as dense, and you could clearly see there was no person or animal around or within them. My sister traced a symbol on the ground, again, something for protection, but nothing changed. We decided to leave, but halfway up the trail, I started to have a panic attack and had to stop. My sister and best friend tried to calm me as I watched the bushes shake closer and closer to me. They held my hands and tried to talk about light subjects as we continued up the trail. Suddenly, the bush next to us shook violently. We all screamed and ran the rest of the way up the trail. I've returned to the place later and had no unusual things happen. I'm not sure my sister ever returned. If anyone is familiar with the central coast of California, it's called the El Moro Elfin Forest. I still don't fully believe what I saw, but I know what I felt. When I told my friend, he blamed it on me being delirious from fear and said that it could have been a bear or mountain lion. I guess I didn't know what I saw, but it was nothing anybody could actually believe unless they experienced it themselves. I grew up in western Canada, just outside Vancouver, a little under a couple hours' drive to the Washington border. One thing about people from British Columbia is that almost everyone goes hiking, the crime in BC isn't anything to raise concerns about, you only need to be more worried about bears, wolves, and mountain lions. It was the beginning of summer, June 2020, everyone was isolated, and I was working from home. After being isolated for what felt like forever, I needed to get outside. While doing some research on hiking trails I hadn't yet been to, I discovered a trail called Golden Ears, which is still to this day one of the most difficult hiking trails due to its lack of maintenance. I was a very experienced hiker, even at 20, but none of my friends could come because they were all sick with COVID. I knew I should have waited till they felt better, but I couldn't stay inside a second longer. I should have just chosen an easier hike, but I didn't. I packed up my bag with my usual gear, with the addition of bare mace because of the season, and two flashlights, one battery operated and one hand cranked. I always carried a backup flashlight, and I'm grateful to this day for it. I made the hours drive and saw from the road markers that I was at the center point of the Washington border and my hometown. When I started the trail, it was about 12 p.m. I usually leave my phone in my car because you never get a signal out there anyway. With too many trees and mountains, I do carry an emergency radio if I really need to call for help. The trail I was on was an estimated 6-hour hike, which wouldn't be an issue as it made a full circle and I would get home no later than 8 p.m., before it would get dark. I parked on the southeast end of the trail and started my way, following the yellow markings of my trail, and found some beautiful high cliffs with just the most gorgeous views. The weather was very forgiving that day, just beautiful, with no rain like we are used to out west. The way the lakes would look, like beautiful twinkling gems, and the breathtaking scenery of the mountains and local fauna. As I moved deeper into the trail, 
I started noticing some of the markings were fading and becoming harder to spot. This wasn't an unusual thing on hiking trails so deep in the mountains, but it did raise some concern. It felt like I was getting lost, but I kept persevering, checking my map and my compass to direct me instead of the markings. I would mark the lake I passed by so I would remember where I came from and where I needed to go. I think I got so worked up checking my map that I could no longer see any markings or paths, I thought this was a good time for a break. I got out some snacks and tried to relax myself. Keeping yourself together is crucial when you're lost, it is life or death, and any decision I make going forward has to come from a sane mind. As I packed up, I heard the faintest noise through the trees, like a steam train that was far in the distance, but I blamed it on the wind and some hollow branches. My watch read 5 p.m., and I couldn't imagine that if I had already spent five hours on the trail, I would have seen something by then, even with relentlessly checking my map. It literally felt as if someone had picked me up and dropped me at a random point, I couldn't recognize anything around me. When I checked my map and compass, I looked for anything that could be on the map. I needed to find higher ground. I saw a nearby incline and decided that sometimes you have to get deeper in to really get out. When I reached the incline, I saw in the distance what looked like a worn-out crossroads sign. There was nothing on the map that indicated there was a railroad of any kind, so I assumed it must have been some joke or mistake that nobody bothered to fix. When I decided that I really needed to turn back, I somehow lost my balance on what was sturdy ground, fell down the hill, and rolled nearby to the tracks. The fall had broken my watch, and it stopped at 5.13 pm, and it was now golden hour, meaning I had less than a few hours before the sun would set. I hadn't thought to pack my climbing gear because I read that there were no cliffs or rocks to climb on the trail. I still feel how panicked and stunned I was at how much everything was going wrong, but they don't teach you what to do when things go right, they teach you when things don't go according to plan. Curiosity might have killed the cat, but I still approached the tracks because it was almost like I was supposed to see them, they looked worn out and they seemed to stretch on a while. Nearby was a small river that was flowing down north, so I decided to follow upstream until I found an incline where I could manage to climb it, where the tracks seemed to grow. Walking along the tracks made it easier on my feet because of the flat surface. The sun was so far hidden behind the myriad of large trees and the abundance of mountains, it could have been still bright out, but I couldn't tell. I felt consumed in the forest. I was slightly hysterical, isolated, alone, and barely armed, I was easy prey if anything caught me off guard, that's when things got even more strange. When I pulled out my flashlight and radio, my radio would only sound static or play old-timey style songs, like ones you would hear in a silent film. It was an old emergency radio my dad had given me, and it can tune into different stations, but it wasn't a time to play music and draw attention to myself. When I turned on my flashlight, it flickered and would barely stay on, which I assumed because I might have forgotten to change the batteries. I tried relentlessly to get the radio to call or relay my message, but it wouldn't stop playing that same stupid tune whenever I turned it on. I kept my radio off in hopes that when I reached higher ground, the signal would improve. I switched to my hand-cranked flashlight, but it wasn't exactly a quiet fix, it just drew attention to my location. I made haste in fear of attracting any sort of predator, I was extremely out of my element and comfort zone. I could feel all sorts of eyes watching me as I made my way up the tracks and against the stream. The sound of the water trickling was the only comfort I had. After about a kilometer of walking, I heard a branch snap behind me. I instantly turned around because I was walking on a railroad, not the ground. When I turned on my cranked flashlight, I saw two larger-than-life eyes blink at me, at the faintest figure of what I thought was a person, so I yelled out to them, and it ran off. Possibly a deer, one might think, but deer aren't usually ones to stay for long after a noise is heard, they're one of the first to run. I continued to convince myself it was a deer, but something didn't feel right about the size of the eyes, I could see how big they glowed, and I was barely 30 feet away. I could start to see the end of the tracks, so I was making progress, but I could hear low grumbling and the sound of leaves crunching in pairs, like someone was putting one foot forward and then the next, and it started to grow closer. I cranked my flashlight some more to see anything around me. I shook my bear mace and had it ready with the cap off. I continued forward, and the stream had ended my only comfort gone, and only tracks remained in the encompassing darkness of the whispering trees. I could finally see the end of the tracks was near, but it was pitch black, and I couldn't make out anything. I started to lose hope so much that I was desperate to even find somewhere to hide. I wouldn't starve, but I didn't want to be someone's next meal. Paranoid from the sounds, I checked behind me with my flashlight almost every other second. As I was about 60 feet from the end, I heard a thud crunching behind me, call it praise intuition, but I could feel something after me. I could hear the wind change as it ran and the ground thud as it moved. I didn't even think to use my flashlight this time, but I turned around, 
and I instantly used my mace. It definitely stunned whatever was behind me, but nothing could mimic the powerful screech it made as it ran off. My ears rang the rest of the night, I could see the faintest silhouette, and there was nothing I could explain or sound sane of mind. I remember running so hard that my lungs weren't even being used, I was just pure muscle and feared moving. The most scary thing about that night wasn't even the thing that stalked me, once I reached the end of the tracks, I was back in the southeast parking lot, where my car sat untouched. I threw my shit in the back, started the car, and left, not turning back. The next morning I went back with my friend to show him, and there wasn't a single trace of tracks, just the bear mace I dropped outside my car. There have been reported drownings and deaths at that place that are unexplained, and I feel like it's those who follow the tracks down instead of up. Who knows? Maybe I really imagined it being there for so long and being afraid. I just never want to feel like prey again. I'm a local to the South Jersey area, Pine Barrens, and all. I hunt, I fish on a regular basis, and my house is in the woods. I'm used to the sounds and things that regularly happen around New Jersey. I've had two experiences that I could never grasp an explanation for and still give me chills. First, it was a cold six-day firearm season, and it was opening day. I set up my stand in a new spot a little bit further in than my previous year. I'm following my bright eyes, reflectors, to get to my stand, and it's pitch black and cold. I'm saying minus four with the wind. It's not common in New Jersey, so it's already eerie as I'm walking through the pines. I get about 25 yards from my tree, and I stop lighting a cigarette before I go up. As I'm standing there, a mile deep in the pine barrens, alone in the dark, I hear a grunt. Not a deer grunt, I'm saying full-blown snarl, it stops and goes on for a minute or two. At this point, my shotgun is stacked to the rim, three rounds, and I'm looking towards the noise. It charges me and gets about 10 yards out, and I shot once, hitting to the left of it, which sent it off into the darkness. So I figured, get in your tree now, so I booked it. I'd say 10 yards away from my tree, and I get charged again, this time from the back, thrusting me to the ground. I went face down in delusion, whatever hit me, I kept going. I stayed in my tree until 10 AM, when it was bright out. My only description of what the thing could be would be a hog mixed with a goat. It was ducking terrifying. BTW, we don't have wild boars, now second. I fish the Great Egg Harbor River regularly, especially striper fishing, which just so happens to land in the fall, which is cold. I walk a trail that used to go to an old shipbuilder manufacturer on the river, and I fish the old structure, Bass Love Structure. However, there is still a building that is standing, not bad until you go in. So one day, me and a friend of mine were going to catch the outgoing tide. We loaded the truck, drove to the trail, and hiked it for about a mile. We get down and set up. It was a nice storm off the coast, so the conditions are perfect. However, about an hour into some good fishing, the rain came, and if you live in the northeast, you know a nor'easter, when it rains, it pours. So we packed our stuff and headed for the building. Once inside, we set our stuff down and figured, duck it, let's chill for a little bit and explore the rooms. Bad idea and a nightmare, shit gets creepy. So we walk up to the second floor, where there is a line of rooms on the right and a balcony on the left looking over the building. As we approach the first door, my friend feels ducked up, like he doesn't want to go anymore, and immediately turns around with a big nope. I like exploring SHT, so I kept on. I checked the first room, nothing spectacular. I kept walking, checking the rooms one by one, and I got to the second to last one and got this weird sensation in my body, almost like I had received the worst news of my life. I broke down. I literally broke down to shit. Once I got it together, I boogied down the stairs, where I found my friend had left and headed for the truck already, leaving all his fishing shit. So I grabbed up everything and ran out, but I had to run back to grab my rod holder that I was using as bum defense. As I looked up at the second story window from the end, I saw a child standing in the window. The scariest SHT I've ever encountered, I'll never go fishing there again. In 2007, I went camping with a few of my friends. I was 16 and was just with some 16 to 18 year olds on this fun camping trip out in the woods behind some of these guys' houses. We picked a spot in the clearing where it would be like a little party kind of site, although I don't do drugs or even smoke weed or any of that. I grew up with that going on all around me so I tried to avoid it. But nobody brought weed or anything along, I don't think. So we all hung out in this clearing, with three different tents set up and a fire pit in the middle. We had planned to spend four to five days, it was summer vacation, so we didn't have school. I think this was early August. Anyway, we all decided to hang out in the clearing, roasting marshmallows and everyone but me having beers. I sat around making s'mores, and the sun was just beginning to set, 
and we were all having a good time. At around 7 o'clock or so, we heard something moving in the bushes nearby, and someone threw an empty beer bottle at the bushes. We heard the smash and watched something climb out of the bushes and lumber back into the trees. We thought it was just some psycho, but everyone got a little bit nervous. Later that night, I was asleep in the tent with three other people, the only person I knew was my friend, Paul, who invited me along. I remember everything being silent, and then I heard a sort of popping sound from the fire, and we all sat up. Crawling out, we could hear people in the other tent's voices saying, the duck was that? Paul unzipped the tent, and we crawled out. The fire that we had put out about an hour or two ago is now roaring with flames. We put it out and thought maybe someone poured gasoline all over the fire, lit a match or lighter, and lit the fire. But we never heard the gas pouring, a match being struck, or a lighter being flicked. We also didn't hear anybody running away because we would have heard them. At this point, there was an awful smell, but I had a stuffy nose and couldn't really make it out. It may have been a skunk, but Paul said one of the other guys said it was like rotten meat, but we had not smelled it earlier or since. Some other people began holding their shirts up to their noses as if a pungent smell had just appeared. We were all a little on edge, but I guess some people agreed, duck it, let's just stay here. Nobody brought any guns to fend us off, but one guy, who was about 18, said he had a pocket knife. Our second day here, nothing happened until it became night again. At around 4 am, we were all fast asleep and awoken by noises behind our tent. We started to get out when Paul said, shut the duck up for a minute. We sat in silence, listening to the noises, which sounded like voices I couldn't make out. The voices seemed to be coming closer to us, and we quietly climbed out of the tent. The voices were still approaching our camp. The two other guys in our tent crept to the other tents and woke the other people up, telling them to get out here at once. All 13 of us stood quietly, listening to the voices get closer and louder. At the point where they had gotten behind our tent, we heard the voices stop, but an eerie humming noise was coming from the trees all around us. One of the guys, I think named Ben, who was 17 or 18, walked about 10 feet from the tree line where the voices had been coming from. He said, Oi! Who is there? And we quietly waited for a response. We heard nothing except distant crickets. He walked back to us, and right then we heard the voices moving away, which to me sounded like what Ben had asked, Oi! Who's there? But it didn't sound like Ben moving away, almost like something was trying to mimic what he sounded like. I could hear the voice sort of crackly and jumply repeating those words as it moved off into the distance. We all got back to our tents but didn't sleep. The next day, someone had left their house to grab something. They came back a little later with a potato gun, saying he'd shoot the duck out of the thing bothering our campsite. Around 7 p.m., not really partying but just huddled around the fire, a girl, just one of two, stands up, practically pissing herself, and we find out what's wrong. Here's one of the similarities I found with the well-known goat man story, she said that last night, when we were listening to the voices, there was another person with us. There were 13 of us now, but she insisted that there had been a 14th. Reading the Anansi goat man story and connecting that experience later made my buttocks clench. We all started to get nervous again, and Ben told us he was going to run back to his house, he and the potato gun guy were neighbors, and he said he was going to get his father to come out here with a gun and wait. Someone went with him, and Paul and I were just talking to each other about how we could leave early if things got too chaotic, which they were starting to get to now. We were in the middle of talking about how we should pack up when we saw Ben standing in the woods. It was clearly him with his blue hoodie and jeans, and he was looking straight at us from about 40 feet away, but we didn't know what the duck he was doing. The person who went with him wasn't standing next to him, it was just him standing alone, watching us. It was a 25-minute walk back to his house, but he couldn't have been back 5 minutes later. Everyone got really uncomfortable, and people started yelling, Hey Ben! What are you doing? But he just kept watching us. We watched as he seemed to slink back into the trees. By now, people were scared out of their minds, and I was too. Why was Ben being a prick and just staring at us and not doing anything? We decided to pile into one tent and wait. A short while later, the other Ben turned up with his dad, and the other person who went with him and his dad was holding a hunting rifle. Ben told him what happened with the voices, and the father walked that way into the trees and took a look around. He said it felt like eyes were watching him from every direction. Paul then told Ben's dad that we just saw another Ben standing in the woods staring at us. Ben's dad walked over there and looked around too. He came back and said he could stay with us and the gun but said he would control it because if we got drunk and started shooting a gun around, we'd all kill ourselves. He slept in Ben's tent. It was our third night here, and it was really ducking creepy. We quietly listened, being anywhere nearby. Paul had a funny look in his eyes and started sweating. 
he later told me that while we were all sitting around, he saw a strange figure moving through the woods, moving its arms around in a strange, jumpy motion. Around 2 a.m., we were all going to get ready for bed, and we heard it. It was saying something, but in a highish voice. It sounded like it was saying, Oi! Who's there? Completely mimicking what Ben had said the night before. Ben's dad tried to pinpoint where the voice was coming from and fired a shot into the trees. That gunshot was loud as duck. Right after, we could hear a creepy male voice chanting. I was scared, Paul was scared, everyone was. The chanting sounded like a deep voice chanting, not multiple people. Underneath the chanting, we could hear something mumbling. Again, another shot was fired, but I saw what Ben's dad was shooting at, a figure crouched low by some bushes. It looked like a direct hit, but the figure did not move, instead, it stood up, sort of hunched over, and moved back into the forest. We raced back into our tents, and I could hear crying and moaning coming from right behind our tent. All four of us in the tent were getting scared, and then I could kind of smell a strong vinegar smell that was very powerful. Then, I noticed what looked like fingertips moving along the tent wall into the door and moving down the zipper to grab the part you used to open. Paul dove over to the zipper and held it down as whoever or whatever tried to pull it open. Paul and one other guy in the tent started yelling, who's out there? And after a minute, we could hear a screeching noise as this thing took off into the darkness. We decided to say, duck the fourth and fifth days, let's get out of here in the morning. Here's the scariest experience of that night. At 3.45 AM, checking my watch, I had to go pee. Since what had just occurred not long ago, I decided I wasn't getting out of the tent and maybe I could stick my bird out of a small zipper opening, but then I pictured whatever it was out there biting or ripping my thing off, so I decided to open up the tent, slither outside just slightly, and pee to the side of the door. As soon as I was finished, I noticed someone by the furthest tent. I grabbed my flashlight beside my pillow, turned it on, and shined it towards the person. It looked like Paul, back facing me, hunched over by the tent. But Paul was right behind me, sleeping in the tent. I crawled back inside but kept my light shining on the other Paul. I whispered, Paul, wake up. And the moment he did, I looked outside to see the other Paul stand up, turn facing toward me, and stare at me. I dove back in, leapt under my sleeping bag, and huddled there awake as I explained to Paul what I had just seen. I guess at one point in the night, I was facing another way and was freaking out, but one of the guys in the tent said he woke up, eyes still half closed as he rolled over, he could see. The other Paul looking through the part of the tent flap I didn't close. He thought it was just Paul coming to wake them up, but he realized the real Paul was asleep right beside him. We packed up and left. So I guess that's the creepiest thing that happened to me. I don't exactly know where this forest was, it was on private property, I think, but goddamn was that ducking scary. Peru Indiana Oki Pinoki. Legend has it that this area of wood was an Indian burial ground. Also, supposedly, a little girl was murdered. Her name was Stephanie. They say if you call her name, you'll hear her screaming, and eventually she'll follow you into the woods. They say there's a significant tree where she was killed, and you can still see the imprints. And there's a haunted cabin somewhere out there. I have only gone at night and have yet to find the tree or the cabin. I found what looked like the foundation for an old home or shed of some sort. And Mrs. and with staff also found eight decaying bodies out there. Camping and hunting are forbidden. You drive down this trail, and the further you go, the more it seems the trees are closing in on you to the point where you can't see the sky. It's always colder here than in the surrounding area. Once you get to the end, you get to what's called the Devil's Circle, which is a circle where nothing grows and you park. There are multiple trails all around the circle that lead into the woods. It's very confusing, and it's easy to get lost. I've been lost twice and found my way back to the main road, which is SR 124. The circle sits right next to a creek or stream. I've never seen it, but you can hear it. For some reason, the dirt road that leads to Devil's Circle has more paranormal activity than the woods themselves. People sometimes go out there and use Quija boards. I remember as I was leaving, I found the lid of a box on a Quija board on the dirt road. Sometimes, as you're leaving, you see what looks like people running in the open fields out of the corner of your eye. 